to the nations. I was simply assigned as a pastor to one small Saskatchewan town. But I do dare to believe that the same God who put his hand on Jeremiah had put his hand on me and given me a message to share with you. God told me to preach in Delilah, and I'm going to keep on preaching in Delilah until he tells me to stop. I want to take you this morning to a good news story. It's found in Luke chapter 4, verses 31 to 44. Then Jesus went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and on the Sabbath he began to teach the people. They were amazed at his teaching because his message had authority. In the synagogue there was a man possessed by a demon, an evil spirit. He cried out at the top of his voice, Ha! What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. And the demon threw the man down before them all and came out without injuring him. All the people were amazed and said to each other, What is this teaching? With authority and power, he gives orders to the evil spirits when they come out. And the news about him spread throughout the surrounding area. Jesus left the synagogue and went to the home of Simon. Now Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever, and they asked Jesus to help her. So he bent over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. She got up at once and began to wait on them. When the sun was setting, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness, and laying his hands on each one, he healed them. Moreover, demons came out of many people, shouting, You are the Son of God! He rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew he was the Christ. At daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. The people were looking for him, and when they came to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. And he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. I want to draw your attention this morning to two words in this passage. Those words are power and authority. According to Luke chapter 4, verse 32, the people were amazed at Jesus' teaching because his message had authority. And in verse 36 it says, the people were amazed because with authority and power, he gave orders, and even the evil spirits obeyed him. Power and authority are synonyms. I think I was in grade four when I first learned about synonyms. They told me that synonyms were words that had the same meaning. But in fact, no two words have exactly the same meaning. If they had exactly the same meaning, there'd just be one word. So, I think that a better definition of a synonym is two words that are similar in meaning. Let's say that synonyms are words with a similar meaning. The two words today, power and authority, are synonyms. But there is a distinction between power and authority. Power and authority are not exactly the same. Power is positional and title-driven. When you have power, you can tell people what to do, and they have to do it. The boss at work has power. The teacher in the classroom has power or maybe not as much as they would like. <laughs> Authority comes from within you. Someone can have 
power in your life, but no authority. Someone can have authority in your life, but no power. Or someone can have both power and authority in your life. In this world, most people just lead from power. People with power can intimidate those who may feel that they have no power. Authority, on the other hand, is earned. Authority causes you to invest in others, to bring value into their lives. Authority is the ability to influence people, to want to do the right thing. The message of Jesus came with authority. He influenced people to want to do the right thing. Ideally, the people who have power in your life have also earned your respect. They not only tell you what to do, they also have the authority or the right to speak into your life. Jesus had both power and authority. In fact, he has absolute power and he has ultimate authority. You've heard the saying that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. The only one who could handle absolute power is one who is absolutely perfect and who cannot be corrupted. There is one like that, and that one is Jesus. He has absolute power. He also has ultimate authority. We're going to do a little word study this morning. The word power, found here in the Gospel, is the way that we translate the Greek word dunamis. Now the New Testament was written in Greek, which was the common language at the time of Jesus. From the Greek word dunamis, we get our word dynamite. Maybe that gives you a sense of what dunamis means. There's, there's power here. It may also be translated as strength or even as violence. And then there's the word authority. It comes from the Greek exosia. It means the kind of authority that a judge would have. It's a jurisdiction. It's a right. It talks of one who has the right to take the action that is being taken. Jesus has the right to speak into our lives. Now Jesus of Nazareth may have appeared to be only a common carpenter turned traveling preacher. But even the demons recognized who he really was. The Holy One of God, according to Luke 4, 34. The Son of God, according to Luke 4 and 41. No wonder then that Jesus claimed all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. That's in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18. So, I want you, I guess ideally this morning, I want you to share the amazement of the people who heard Jesus back then. We ought to be amazed in the presence of Jesus. Jesus is amazing. He really is. His power and his authority are absolutely amazing. But now I want to shift gears a little bit. The reality is that you and I live in a broken world. The truth is that life is often unfair. The unfairness of life and the brokenness of the world lead some people to question whether Jesus really has the power and the authority to make a difference in any life. Some people may even wonder whether God is really loving and good. And sometimes whether he exists at all. Jesus never 
promise that we would be spared from heartbreak, from sickness, from disillusionment, or from tribulation. In fact, he warned us that we would face those kinds of things. The Apostle Paul, for example, experienced all of these, and yet he persevered. Some of you are familiar with the Old Testament story of a man named Job, who went through every kind of imaginable hardship. He lost all of his wealth. He lost all of his children in what appeared to be a natural disaster. He lost the confidence of his wife, who said you might as well curse God and die. He lost the encouragement of his friends. They showed up, but their message soon turned sour. He lost his health. Everything seemed to be against him. And he expressed maybe the ultimate trust when he said, even if God kills me, still I will trust him. God never promises that his followers will be blessed with health and wealth. People who believe that Christians will always be healthy and wealthy and successful in this world's terms are bound to be disappointed. In fact, Christians who adopt the prosperity gospel are often the most frustrated and unhappy people because their philosophy of life does not correspond with their reality. Sickness and sorrow in our world are the result of the fall, that is, the sinful condition into which every one of us is born. That does not mean that when individuals are sick, it's because they have sinned. It does mean that there will be sickness in this world as long as there is sin in this world. The evidence of Christ in your life is not an absence of suffering. The evidence of Christ in your life is the way in which you respond to that suffering when it comes. I'd like to read you from a letter that Peter wrote. 1 Peter chapter 2, and I'm going to pick it up in verse 20. If you suffer for doing good, and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. Wow. We don't like to talk about that so much. But Jesus suffered, and we're called to follow his example in the way that we handle suffering. When you suffer, do as Jesus did. Entrust yourself to God. Now, for example, if you're sick, I am certainly not telling you that you should not pray for healing. Absolutely, we should pray. The Bible tells us we ought always to pray and not give up. When we pray, we pray in Jesus' name. Now, sometimes people think that praying in Jesus' name simply means that at the end of your prayer, you say, in Jesus' name, before you say, amen. And it's okay to say that. In fact, it's good to say that. You don't have to say that every time you pray. The idea is not that this is a little mantra that you repeat. The idea is that when you pray in Jesus' name, you are praying in the power and with the authority of Jesus Christ. It means that we pray as Jesus did, in the Spirit, 
in which Jesus prayed. And what was the spirit in which Jesus prayed? When he prayed, he acknowledged and believed that all things were possible with God. He knew that all things are possible with God. But when he prayed, he prayed not for his own will, but for God's will to be done. God always answers that kind of prayer. Ask God to direct you to pray as he wants you to pray. I came across a quote this week by Oswald Chambers, whose devotional writings are commonly read and used by Christians in many places. And this is what he had to say. I thought it struck the point so well. The circumstances of a saint's life are ordained by God. Now, let me just stop there for a moment. Ordained means that he is the one who has arranged them and made them happen. Okay? The circumstances of a saint's life are ordained by God. You may be sitting there and saying, well, I'm no saint. You know, you may be a saint and don't know it. According to the Bible, a saint is anyone who has committed their life in faith to Jesus Christ. So we've got saints here this morning. And really, there are only two kinds of people, right? The saints and the ants. <laughs> the circumstances of a saint's life are ordained by God. In the life of a saint, there is no such thing as chance. God, by His providence, brings you into circumstances that you can't understand at all. But the Spirit of God understands. God brings you to places, among people, and into certain conditions to accomplish a definite purpose through the intercession of the Spirit in you. Jesus Christ has the power to answer prayer. And he has promised to answer all true prayers. But he reserves to himself the authority to decide how that prayer should be answered. Ultimately, he will answer that prayer not according to what I want or you want, but according to what our Father wants. You see, we don't know the big picture. We don't know the big picture. God is the one who decides. When someone is sick, for example, it is God who decides who is going to be healed miraculously and instantaneously. Who is going to be healed in a natural way or through medical means? Who is going to live? And who is going to die? Remember, this world is not all there is. This is not all there is. Ultimately, there is a better world. There is a life beyond life for those who put their faith in God. And Ultimately, everything will be made right. Jesus recognized that God always has the final word. God does not always answer prayer the way we want Him to. But He always answers. God has an agenda that we know very little about. One of the most Difficult questions to answer is the question, why? We don't always get an answer to why. Why did this happen to me? Why did that happen to the person I love? Why? We don't know God's agenda, but we know God's heart. God's heart is love. Always love eternal, limitless, perfect love. Amen.
Father, we do come to you in Jesus' name. We do pray in the power and with the authority of Jesus Christ, who is our Lord. And we ask today that you would have your way in each of our lives. We don't know the end from the beginning. We don't know what is best. We don't know which way to go often. But you do. And you are working a divine plan. You have a plan for our individual lives. But in your plan, each of our lives is part of your great purpose in this work. Thank you. Thank you. That ultimately, everything will be made right. And one day, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father.